dedicated to Eastern and Southern Kentucky. This is WYMT Mountain News at 11. Good evening, I'm Keaton Hall. President Biden yesterday pardoned all prior federal offenses of simple marijuana possession. He challenged governors to do the same at the state level. David Mattingly has more on Governor Andy Bashir's response. In a brief statement coming from Governor Bashir's Deputy Communications Director, it seems that the governor is up for the president's challenge when he says the governor agrees that no one should be in jail simply because of possession of marijuana. The comment comes less than 24 hours after President Biden pardoned all prior federal offenses of simple marijuana possession and urged governors to do the same. Bashir's office stopped short of announcing any similar action, however, opting instead to get more information, saying the White House had not alerted and has not briefed our office on exactly what his pardons may require and the specific details of what they will and will not cover. State groups, including the ACLU and the NAACP, say the pardons would immediately help more than 7,000 Kentuckians, many of whom are people of color. The federal change comes at a time when recreational marijuana is legal in 19 states and medical marijuana is legal in 38. Kentucky is not on either list. Despite bipartisan support, medical marijuana failed to pass again in the state legislature and sponsor Jason Nemus doesn't see the pardons making a difference. And it's an interesting concept and it's for certainly good for the individual that's been pardoned, but it doesn't change the conversation in the state legislature. If the federal law is changed though, what would that do? That's a game changer. I mean, uh, one of the major um, obstacles to, to getting it passed in Kentucky is that it's federally illegal. That was David Mattingly reporting. Two people are, ha are facing criminal charges accused of vandalizing church fans to steal their gas. The crime happened Monday at a church in Laurel County. The two people were arrested Thursday after their pictures were posted online. She, uh, she had told me that he said that we could get gas. And she said that she was dismounting the something from something, but she never said she was poking a hole in anything. Just from what we picked up on their Facebook page, was that it was significant damage because they'd actually punctured holes in the gas tanks and made slices in the gas tanks. In addition to the charges from the van vandalism, Natasha Scott is also facing several outstanding warrants on failure to appear in court on shoplifting and on driving on a suspended license. David and Ruby Jacobs have lived in the same house for decades. That was until the flood destroyed everything. The couple thought the water might also take their lives as they said a final goodbye to each other. That's when David Jacobs says a bright light and a powerful hand came to the rescue. I have never felt anything as powerful as that hand as it pulled me and her towards our little house. And we're so thankful from the depths of our hearts. Contractors are working on rebuilding the home now, and high school students from Franklin County also joined in relief efforts. Jacob says he and his wife hope they move back into their home soon. Well, a chilly night already on tap. Frost advisory in effect for our western counties. This goes into effect here in a few hours and will run through tomorrow morning. These counties plus the counties in the light blue color under a freeze watch as we head through tomorrow night and into Sunday. So multiple nights of some chilly temperatures on the way and we're working those into the region now. Low 50s and upper 40s at the moment, but you see the blue off to our north and west. That's cooler air moving in on the back side of this cold front. Behind it, the air mass dominated by northern high pressure from the northern plains. This means cooler air and drier air on the way in as we head through the weekend. And you see that cooler air here to our south. We're in the 60s to the north, Indianapolis in the 40s, Columbus in the middle 40s. So cooler air is on the way. We're going to get down into the 30s for many tonight. Future view may be overdoing it a touch, but we're back into the 60s as we head into tomorrow afternoon and then tomorrow nights when the cool air really hits. We're talking upper 30s by bedtime. Getting out the door tomorrow, it's going to be chilly if you got early plans. Into the 40s to start, back up to near 60 by the afternoon. If you're headed up to South Carolina, or <laughs> headed up to Lexington to see Kentucky take on South Carolina, 54 at kick, 42 at the half, and down into the 30s as we get things finished out tomorrow night. We're down into the 30s, eventually falling back into the low 30s, perhaps even 
upper 20s in portions of the region before rebounding back to near 60 Sunday afternoon and we're back into the 40s and 30s Sunday night into early Monday. The Community Trust Bank 7-day forecast keeps the sunshine with us as we head into Monday and Tuesday. 71 Monday, 74 Tuesday, 76 with perhaps a stray shower chance on Wednesday. That's when our next front starts to move in late Wednesday and into Thursday. Could bring us a few showers and storms before another cool air mass moves on in for this time next week. Keaton? I like the fight song there. I was getting into it. It's definitely football weather. Thanks, Evan. The trail ride is underway at Mine Made Adventure Park in Knott County. Hundreds have flocked to the recreational area to ride on the trails and join for some community fun. Knott County Trail Master Roger Bulin says he can feel excitement in the air. Everybody's excited right now. I mean, the weather's pretty. They can get out and ride and have a good time. And they uh, and then got the music coming tonight, and everybody's kind of looking forward to it, you know. The flood relief concert starts tomorrow at 5 p.m. Admission is $25. The Jenny Wiley Festival just wrapped day two, leaving one more day to enjoy the festivities. Organizers say this year's turnout has already been incredible, and it's nice to see so many people supporting the annual event. Vendors, vendors say it's all about community, meeting new customers, and sharing a nice weekend to kick off the season. Able to support one another and learn what is in our community, and that kind of gets exciting. The festival is celebrated as the only consecutive festival in the state after restructuring early on during the pandemic to keep things rolling. The 74th annual Daniel Boone Festival has been going on all week and the final day is tomorrow. There are events for everyone from music to the carnival. Merrill Bargo with the festival staff says many of the events they hold at the festival have been going on since the festival began in 1948. We still have a lot of the same events. Um, and it's a community event. It has a community atmosphere and uh, it's a homecoming. I call it a homecoming because a lot of people comes off vacation, comes to the festivals. It's just, a, it's just a family affair. Bargo says they're proud to say the Daniel Boone Festival is the oldest continuous running festival in Kentucky. If you've not been to the Daniel Boone Festival yet, make sure you do not miss the parade. That's going to be tomorrow at 2 p.m. Today was also the first day of the fall meet at Keeneland in Lexington. The meet runs through October 29th with races Wednesdays through Sundays. There are still general admission tickets available for most days, but Keeneland officials say Friday and Saturday tickets usually sell out pretty quick. Keeneland is also hosting the Breeders' Cup this year. That event is on November 4th and 5th. Big Sandy Community and Technical College cut the ribbon on its new state-of-the-art dental facility called the East Kentucky Oral Health Training Center. The center will be the new home for the college's Dental Assisting Dental Hygiene Integrated Program Certificate, Diploma, and AAS Degree Programs. And the Community Dental Health Coordinator Certificate, Delta Dental and Workforce Opportunities, a grant initiative for the Appalachian Region through the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, funded the creation of the center. President Biden says Russia is pushing the world closer to a nuclear conflict as Vladimir Putin's forces continue to lose ground in Ukraine. CBS's Natalie Brand has details, plus the latest from Ukraine's president, on the possibility of nuclear war. President Biden ignored questions from the press one day after expressing his concern about the threat of a Russian nuclear attack. We have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, the president said at a fundraiser Thursday night. The administration says the comments were not based on any new intelligence about the likelihood of an attack. We have not seen any reason to adjust our own strategic nuclear posture. It's estimated Russia has one to 2,000 short-range nuclear weapons at storage sites around the country, including one close to the border. Ukraine's yeah, President Volodymyr Zelensky told the BBC he believes Russian officials are preparing their society for nuclear war. They don't know if they will use or they will not use. I think that it's dangerous even to speak about it. During his comments at the fundraiser, President Biden also questioned if Putin can find an off-ramp as Ukrainian forces continue reclaiming territory. The way his military has performed in this war is not indicative of a major superpower. Sharon Squassoni is a research professor at George Washington University and has held senior positions at the State Department. She says the key objective now is to make sure this conflict does not cross the nuclear threshold. I don't think that threat is credible.
Mostly because that could literally invite nuclear Armageddon. Tensions are likely to remain high with Russia planning nuclear exercises later this month. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. A group that documents war crimes in Ukraine won the Nobel Peace Prize on Friday. The Ukrainian Center for Civil Liberties is sharing the award with imprisoned Belarus rights activist Alice Bielyatsky and the Russian rights group Memorial. The Nobel Committee chair said all three are outstanding champions of human rights, democracy, and peaceful coexistence. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you for joining us. John Lowe and Courtney Lane Brewer will have highlights and scores from across the coverage area, plus a preview of Kentucky's game against South Carolina. Appalachian Wireless Sports Overtime is coming your way right after this break. IMT Weathers.